All right, in this video we're going to talk a little bit about enzymes and how they do their job in a little bit more detail. So here we have kind of a cartoon of an enzyme, the big gray blob. Um, enzymes, uh, for our purposes, are, are almost always proteins, and they're, all, they're always going to be bigger than the chemical that they work with. Um, the chemical that they specifically interact with is going to be called the enzyme's substrate. So make sure you have enzyme, the protein, and substrate, the chemical that it kind of fits with, um, clear in your mind. Um, they actually collide together. This cartoon doesn't show that very well, but enzymes and substrates inside of living cells are actually moving around um, at, at totally at random. You might wonder how they could possibly actually come together to interact if they're just moving around randomly. Well, because there are just billions and billions and billions and billions of both of these types of molecules effectively inside cells. So there's just so many of them that the odds that any two of them actually randomly come together and collide are, are pretty likely. Um, they have to collide at the enzyme's active site. So that's another important term. Um, and the idea here is that the enzyme has to have a very specific shape to be able to fit the chemical that it actually interacts with. And so sometimes we like to use metaphors like the lock and key model. Um, for example, this key that I have has a very specific set of bumps and ridges that enable it to fit only within one type of lock. Um, and so similarly, enzymes also have three-dimensional shapes. Um, this looks like a 2D cartoon, but it, they're actually in three dimensions. And they have one little pocket within the protein that, that fits the chemical that it works with very specifically. Sometimes textbooks like to call it induced fit because technically the enzyme kind of might change a little bit shape as the chemicals coming in to fit it even better, but I'm not too worried about that concept. So what happens when the substrate and the enzyme collide at the active site? Well, then the enzyme can help speed up a chemical reaction to help the substrate turn into other chemicals. So maybe the, uh, the, the particular chemical substrate was sort of capable of turning into other chemicals through a chemical reaction, but the enzyme just makes that process faster. And so we see here at the end of this cartoon that, that now the chemical has turned into two completely different chemicals. Maybe in this case the enzyme helped speed up a chemical reaction that cut up the original chemical substrate into smaller chemicals. Sometimes that happens. I'll, I will also briefly say that there are some enzymes that do just the opposite. Maybe they actually fit two smaller chemical substrates and they speed up the chemical reaction that helps put them together. So just at the end of this cartoon, we see that the products leave. Um, as it turns out, the products don't fit in the active site as well as the original chemical substrate did, so they just fall out and leave. And that's important because the enzyme then is reusable. The enzyme just isn't a one-use thing. Um, as long as that there's another chemical substrate around to fit, it will be able to collide with that substrate chemical as well and speed up its chemical reaction. So enzymes are, are reusable um, and are constantly just kind of uh, wandering around, uh, moving at random, and, and speeding up the chemical reaction of a substrate when they collide. So let's just kind of introduce chemical reactions in the first place here and how they fit in with, with kind of the enzyme substrate relationship. Um, first of all, we could say um, this is a sam sample chemical reaction that we're actually going to study in lab. So um, H2O2 is hydrogen peroxide, a very common chemical you might find in your parents' medicine cabinet, for example. And anytime we have um, chemicals on the left side of a chemical equation like this, we're going to call those the reactants. Those are the chemicals going into the reaction. They are going to be the ones that turn into the things that we see on the right side, which we would call the chemical products. Now, as it turns out, reactant, um, uh, in this case, because we're gonna have an enzyme involved, we can see that the, the, the H2O2 can also be called the chemical substrate that fits into the peroxidase enzyme. Um, as it turns out, we're going to write the enzymes typically above the chemical um, equation arrow um, because we want to show that it is not itself turning into something else. It's just helping the chemical reactants turn into the chemical products. So if we have an enzyme involved, like the one we wrote up above the arrow, um, maybe it's actually interacting with some of the reactants, and so those reactants would be the substrate of that enzyme. Another kind of helpful um, quick little hint, enzymes often end with the suffix ace, A-S-E, 
although not always. So, um, but but many of them do. Okay, so let's um, just kind of finish by talking about what enzymes actually do um, when they collide with a substrate. How are they speeding up its chemical reaction? How are they helping the chemical reactant? Well, um, as it turns out, we're not going to go into too much chemistry detail here, but, but chemicals, um, th this graph is, is portraying what we call an energy reaction diagram. So um, the x-axis is just the, the, the reaction proceeding. So the reactants on the left are trying to turn into the products on the right. And um, on the y-axis, we have energy. And what I want you to imagine in the middle is that, that chemicals um, coming into the chemical reaction exist in one form. And in order to turn into something else, they might have to go over a little bit of a hill. Think about it as like you trying to like bike uphill or something like that. You have to um, get over that hill before you can kind of um, be where you want to be. And the higher the hill, the slower the chemical reaction. And so that concept of this hill in between is actually called activation energy. And what enzymes do is they simply lower the hill. They're going to make it easier um, for chemical reactants to get over that hill, and so they have an easier time becoming products. And so by lowering the activation energy, they speed up the chemical reaction. All right. Um, I just kind of wanted to insert this in here because maybe in a previous video you watched a discussion of ATP um, and now we're talking about enzymes and they kind of sound similar. Um, as it turns out, both of them are ne necessary tools for cells. You need both ATP and enzymes. I would flesh this out a little bit more in an, in a, an advanced biology class, but for our purposes here in an introductory course, I'll just kind of keep it simple by saying that ATP makes chemical reactions possible in the first place. Some chemical reactions would never be possible without getting a phosphate from ATP. So they kind of make the reactions possible, but enzymes might still be involved because sometimes chemical reactions are possible, but they just occur too slowly to be useful for the cell. So the enzyme's job is to make something that's already possible faster. So both tools are necessary in cells. The last thing I want to say is that sometimes enzymes can lose their ability to interact with their chemical substrates, and that would happen if they lose their shape. Um, if an enzyme were to completely lose its shape, especially at the active site, we would call that enzyme denatured. It's, uh, sometimes students will tell me that the enzyme died. Um, enzymes are a part of living organisms. They're not living themselves. So we don't say that they died. Uh, the enzymes denature if they lose their shape. Um, and then that might kind of raise the obvious question, well, what, what causes an enzyme to denature? Well, I'm going to not answer that question only because I want you to investigate it in the lab. So you will um, in investigate factors that cause enzymes to denature. Um, just to give you a quick uh, metaphor again, if I were to melt this key um, you know, and let it kind of re-solidify, it would all still be there, but it would lose its function, right? Because it wouldn't fit in the lock anymore. And that's what happens when enzymes denature. And I'll just um, give you also kind of a quick idea that, that living organisms try desperately to avoid denaturation. And so a really important aspect of trying to maintain homeostasis is to try and prevent uh, factors from getting so out of balance that it leads to enzyme denaturation. Okay, so um, just tried to talk a little bit about how enzymes work. They have to collide with their substrates. Um, at the active site within enzymes, and we, we talked about how their fit is very particular. Different enzymes will execute one particular chemical job because they have one particular shape. And then we talked about how they actually make reactions faster, um, and we talked about how they did that by lowering the activation energy, lowering the hill to make it easier for chemicals to turn into other chemicals.